Adoptive or foster parents who return their children. What's your story? Story 1. My grandmother is a foster mother. I have several stories, but by far the most messed up one is Lauren. Name not changed, cuz forget her. When Lauren came to live with us, she was a sweet Pentecostal girl who only wore skirts and never cussed. She was in foster care because her dad had violated her. For several months, she was perfect and quickly became one of my best friends. We were both 14, 16 when the story ends. Then it all unraveled when she stole my mom's alcohol and blamed it on me. Well, it came out that it wasn't me and that Lauren had been lying about a lot more stuff. She attacked my grandmother and she called the police. While waiting for the police, Lauren went and beat her face black and blue and tore a good amount of hair out. She told the cops my grandmother did it. The other foster girl had told the police that she had seen Lauren doing it to herself. So that was the end of Lauren living with us. After leaving, she told her caseworker that my grandmother abused her and that she was only fed three times a week or something like that. But for the first time, Lauren messed up. She said she wasn't given anything for Christmas and didn't have a birthday party. Her caseworker stopped by the day of her party to drop off gifts, but left before she saw Lauren. That was the beginning of everyone realizing how manipulating this girl was. After about a year later, the trial for the ass abuse happened. Wasn't there, but grandmother had been asked to be a character witness against Lauren, or something like that, don't really know. And don't think she actually testified, but this is what she told me. It came out that Lauren made every little bit of it up. Before foster care, Lauren was raised in a privileged home where she got everything she wanted. She wasn't even religious. She made up the Pentecostal stuff to make my grandmother and probably the other foster parents she was with trust her more. When she was 12, she was dating a 24-year-old. I don't think he knew her real age until her parents caught them. She looked a lot older. And her parents forbade her from seeing him and took her phone away. So she called his mom and told her that her dad abused her. I'm not going into the details, but it was very detailed and graphic. And she made it all up. She ruined her father's business, her mother's business, and her brother got bullied. All because she couldn't date a guy 12 years older and couldn't have her phone. I was on the fence about it after the trial. I couldn't believe she made it up. Her story never changed. But then she ran away from her foster home. She posted a video on Facebook stating she was safe and she did in fact lie about everything. All she wanted was to go home to her parents because she was living in an abusive foster home call hogwash on them being abusive. Although, guess it's possible. She manipulated everything, so I don't know. Seriously messed up story. There's a lot of progress lately on real victims getting a real voice and getting heard about their stories. This girl does nothing to further that cause. It's sad to think there are such manipulative people out there. I wonder what happened to all the other people in her wake and if they were able to pick up the pieces of their life in any way. Story 2. My mom was a foster parent when I was a child. We had a number of successful cases where they were eventually adopted. One set of kids, remember, we had a going away party and cried when they left even though we were happy for them. We were well liked in the system because we would take in siblings and older kids. One girl we got when she was 17 and she had no desire to be adopted so we just let her run out her time with us. One set of brothers though made my parents throw in the towel. My parents are very stern people, and my dad isn't scared of anybody. He's very tough, farmer his whole life, but the older brother couldn't be controlled. The younger one was terrified of him. There was also myself and my two siblings in the home. It started with him putting stuff in our food. He got banned from the school bus for having a knife, and we didn't know where he got it, then hitting my siblings and I, even his own brother, finding substances and alcohol in his room when he was 12. My dad would call social services every day to get them to take him back. We were happy to have the younger brother, but my parents felt their own kids and the brother were in danger. One day, the kid had a raging fit. We knew it was coming. He snapped and started chasing my little brother, who was three and had hearing loss with a hockey stick. My mother grabbed all of us and we locked ourselves in the bathroom. She called my dad, who showed up and had to hold this kid down and rip the stick out of his hand literally threw him and his things out the door and called the police. We all waited in the locked house while this kid tried to beat down our doors and windows. 
Turns out he was placed with us because nobody else would take him. My mom would only take nonviolent adults or kids under the age of five after that. That's really tragic. Not just because this kid just could not be controlled. It was tragic because these people were really well-liked and picked up kids nobody else would take and were successful. And then this kid goes in and just ruins it for everyone. It's sad that they had to restrict who they would take in now. I wonder where this kid is now. Story 3. When we were called about a two-year-old boy, we were told that he was difficult, that there were some behavioral problems, and that he was active. Lies, lies, lies. Jay was our first placement, and we went into it with shiny eyes, certain we could take on this boy and make him all better. Within 24 hours, I had reservations. A week later, I was begging the agency for help. Four months later, and it was done. Mentally, this child was six months old, and he was never going to improve. He was big for his age. He was fast, and he was angry. There was never a real diagnosis. The most severely autistic child anyone had ever seen? Sure. But also aggressive, banging his head against everything until there was a bony ridge on his head? Grocery trips? A nightmare. Going into town was worse. He ran towards traffic, and as a 40-year-old woman, long high-speed chases were beyond my abilities. I asked for help, begged for respite, only to have the agency tell me that was my responsibility to find. When my daughter's beloved Irish setter had to be put down, I told him they would either keep him at the agency for an hour, or they could pick up his stuff at the end of the day. During that hour, while holding my daughter, they called four times. It took two social workers in a room to keep him confined, and they had no idea. Really? My final straw was when he knocked a one-year-old baby to the ground and stood on her chest. We could no longer deal with him. At the next house, he stayed a month. The next three houses? One day. Then he was moved to a special home. We had five children in the house now. Two biological, two foster, one adopted, the one-year-old he stood on. And after a long day of running and appointments... My husband and I still look at each other and say, still easier than Jay. Well, this one seems to be a little bit on the opposite side of the previous story. It seems like they got through the worst appointment they had to begin with, but still wanted to take on cases. I wonder what kind of rules they set for themselves on what kind of kids they take. I'm glad they're still continuing to take kids in. Story (sighs) 4. Awfulness. I'm a single mom. I have a grown biological daughter and a 16-year-old biological son. I adopted a very difficult-to-deal-with son from foster care when he was 10, and he's now 12. Was asked to take a 15-year-old because of the success I've had with my youngest. I worked very hard to have him be a part of my family. We had visits and contact for almost a year before they moved him in. He was a tough nut to crack, and the whole time we were visiting, he said he wanted to be adopted. When he got to my house, within two weeks, he was saying he didn't want to be adopted and that he had no need for another mom. He had a mom. That's fine. I went in as a foster slash adopt to be someone's mom, but I could try to just work with being a caretaker and not a family member. He also very obviously had Asperger's. Well, obvious after I weaned him down off some of the antipsychotics that they had him on that had him sleeping 12 plus hours a day when he first moved in. So, with the Asperger's making a normal conversation nearly impossible, I was finding myself a caretaker of a child who had no desire to join my family. He just wanted out of a group home. And he can make no real connection because his mannerisms and the way he related was so off that it just felt like he was talking to you and not hearing a word you said. Then, enter the mom visits. Once a month, he visited his mom for an evening. Then about a week later, he would explode on me in ever-increasingly violent ways. After each incident, I tried to show him that I was there for him and that we could work on it, but he made it clear he felt no remorse. And if my biological son wasn't there, being bigger than him, and he was the biggest person in the house with me and my 12-year-old, then there was a pretty decent chance that would happen again. I didn't feel safe. So even though I spent a year visiting with him and had him in my house for six months, When he pulled a knife on me and my 12-year-old and when I called 911 and found that it took the cops 45 minutes to get to my house, had to tell the county that no longer felt like it was a good idea for him to be there. But despite that seemingly seeming like an easy decision, it was an awful one. Had gone in to help kids, not bounce them back into the system. Story 5. 
I don't know if this counts because I was never technically either of those categories. However, I became legal guardian for my nephew when he was 20 months old and raised him until he was almost 7 years old. The entire time it was known that it would be temporary. Originally, it was supposed to be one year while my sister got her life together. Needless to say, my sister didn't bother getting her life together. Instead, she got pregnant, then got married, then got pregnant again, and now lives in a nightmare of a situation. I would have happily raised my nephew until he was grown but his dad wanted custody of him and was working very hard for it. After a couple of years, we began to grow our relationship with my nephew's father and worked really hard on co-parenting. His dad remarried and has a young daughter now, and we felt that instead of trying to give my sister more and more time, we needed to end a guardianship for my nephew's sake. In reality, the longer we had him, the harder it was to give him back. But as difficult as it was, I wanted to save him as much heartache as possible and have it over with while he was still young enough to heal. It doesn't help that we moved 400 miles away from my husband's job, but we're doing our best to visit him every two or three months or have him come visit us. We also talk to him every single week. Well, as much as you can talk to a seven-year-old. We didn't want to give him back, but we knew in the long run it was what was best for him and his family and his relationship with his sister. Story 6. My sister was a foster child. She went through several homes. Most of the time, it was because of the cruddy environment she was placed in, like people who were clearly just using kids to get the checks and had upwards of seven foster kids living in a double wide or something. But there were a couple of times where she would be placed in a home and she wouldn't get along with the other kids, and the parents would ask for her to be moved so as to avoid conflict and ensure a better living environment for everyone. And other times, in her own words, she was a nightmare for the parents, and they would eventually give up and ask for her to be rehomed. Edit. If you're wondering, we ended up adopting her. Her and I were the same age, and we had known her since she was a toddler when she immigrated from Haiti. Her dad married a woman who was abusive to her, so she was put in foster care when she was 14. Her mother became her guardian of sorts, making sure she was taken care of and providing stability throughout her life. When it became clear how messed up the system is, my mom convinced my father to go along with the adoption. She's 25 now and doing amazing. Can't imagine where she'd be if it weren't for my mom. Oh, I'm glad this one had a happy ending. It sounds like everybody else, except for the family that adopted her, was a nightmare situation for her. Did this situation work out simply because there was only one other child that was her age? I guess that means there was more attention to her and not just to a whole bunch of kids that were all in a closed space. I'm glad that one worked out. Story 7. I'm late to the show, but we're in the middle of this very thing right now. As foster parents, we adopted our son when he was three. We saw some behavior issues, but figured that it was nothing outside the norm for a traumatized child. When he was nine, he began passionately acting out. We put him in counseling. The day after Thanksgiving, he threatened to unalive himself, so his counselors advised us to have him hospitalized. A year later, 2015, he burned our home down a few days before Christmas. He's been gone since. He stayed in one residential facility for almost a year and transferred to another one this past January. He told his counselor he had stood in our doorway at night with a knife, contemplating unaliving us in our sleep. We made the decision not to allow him back home. In order to terminate our parental rights, we have to be investigated for child abuse, specifically abandonment. I'm a teacher and my husband is a cop. It can mean we lose our jobs. Our other two younger boys are scared of him. We hired a lawyer literally today and paid a $5,000 retainer. That's in addition to the thousands and thousands we've already spent replacing things that were lost in the fire and paying for his care. The system sucks. After we spoke to folks with the state, we were told he has to come home and hurt one of us for us to be able to avoid being charged with abandonment. It's a mess. That just doesn't make sense. Was there any proof that the kid burned the house down? If there is, doesn't that figure in to how dangerous this kid is? It sucks that the only way they could avoid being under suspicion was if they allow him to hurt one of them. I don't think that's going to happen. Story 8. I am the biological son of foster parents. They did care for at least 20 years, 10 before I was born and 10 afterward. They also adopted my older sister at birth two years before that. On only two occasions have they asked the Ministry of Children and Families to remove a child from their home. 
and both times were very extreme cases. The first was before I came along. At the time, they cared for a young man who to this day is spoken of as their most difficult child. It all reached ahead when he deliberately attempted to set their truck on fire while they were all inside. The second case came not long before they chose to leave foster care. It's not the entire reason they left, but I believe it to be a contributing factor. Anyway, a particular young teen they had in their care was arguably one of the better behaved ones. Hell, I even considered him a good friend and a role model. That is, until he violated my older sister one night and was gone the next morning. I am legitimately surprised by how fast this occurred and how well they were able to hide it from me. I literally went to bed one night and the next morning he was gone. I wouldn't even find out what happened for two or three years. Story 9. Obligatory, not my story, but. My ex was slash is a behavioral analyst. Her job is to treat and educate children with severe behavioral slash emotional problems. One kid in particular, around nine years old, was showing behaviors on the personality disorder spectrum, aka sociopathy slash psychopathy. Prone to bouts of extreme violence, enjoyed unaliving small animals, utter lack of empathy, that sort of thing. Thing was, when he wasn't in a tantrum or unaliving things, he seemed very normal and polite. A family decided to adopt him, knowing that he had issues, but not the details. The very first thing the family did was take him off all his medication. They were kind of hippies. Two weeks later, they surrendered custody after an incident where he unalived a squirrel at the park, hit people with the squirrel's body, swinging it like a club, then threatened to unalive the mother when she tried to take it away. First time he'd shown a behavior that was overtly homicidal. Story 10. We adopted a baby girl a couple years ago. We did not return her, but we definitely considered it. She was substance addicted and had severe FAS. This means for the first three months, she literally screamed bloody unaliving, as in pain, every 15 minutes, 24-7. Nothing could comfort her. She was a hot mess. After not sleeping for months at all, we were running on fumes. Happy to say we stuck with it. And now she's a happy, healthy 18-month-old albeit with a few alcohol-related delays. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.